Welcome in to the overtime segment here at SportsSource.tv. We appreciate you joining us today. It's the all VFL panel right here. We got Daniel Hood, we got Will Overstreet, David Ligon, Sterling Hinton. Always good to have you guys back with us. Uh, this segment brought to you by the folks at Blue Smoke Cigar. Now, I've told you for years about Smoke and Joe. They're actually my oldest lasting client, right back at the beginning. Uh, Smoke and Joe's. Now, they have their new venture. Smoke and Joe's, of course, is still in Blunt County. Great place to go buy cigars in their walk in humidor. But if you're looking for something Knoxville related, a place to relax, to unwind, the best premier cigar lounge I can think of is Blue Smoke Cigar. They do great stuff out there. They've got the uh, card tables, they've got TVs to watch sports or news, they've got the leather seating if you just want to chat. They've got lockers where you can keep your own smokes and your own booze. They've got, which would be good for Sterling, uh, <laughs> take the edge off. And uh, they've got uh, the golf simulators. It, it's really nice. Blue Smoke Cigar. Check it out for yourself this week. All right. Had questions. What we're going to do in our overtime segment this fall, for the most part, we're either going to take viewer questions or cover something that we didn't have a chance to cover in the show. All right. So it's kind of a catch-all. But today we've got tons of questions from people. So let's just run through these. The first one I can knock out here, I think I can knock out, Dylan Bates. I was asked, was he in the Nike Elite 11, which I think they call the, the opening. Uh, I believe he was. Yes, he was. Um, I guess that hints at why haven't we seen much of Dylan Bates so far in his UT career. Five-star athlete. I had somebody tell me the other day that, and this happens, uh, sometimes you get an extra star based on where you announce and who you make your announcement with. Sometimes you get an extra star because your dad had a name. Um, don't want to knock the kid, but he hadn't been able to find the field very much off of special teams. With their current linebacking situation, though, you may see more Dylan Bates moving forward. Uh, anybody have anything to say about Dylan Bates? I got Bates? something to say about Dylan. I mean, he's Go been on. around now. Of course, he's heard all those people say, why is he so to feel? Remember, he comes from good stock. This guy has probably got an attitude. He's ready to show people his, that he's worthy of playing right his now. His father, former Vol and former Dallas Absolutely. Cowboy, Bill Bates, in case you didn't know. Absolutely. And, and Dylan's a great kid. He's doing good in school. He stayed with the program. He didn't transfer. Yep. I'm going to tell you. Be ready for some exciting things from Dylan Bates when he hits the field. All right. Uh, somebody asked, we we're bragging on Georgia Tech. So we we're talking about how difficult it is to defend. And someone said, well, if that offense is so great, why doesn't everyone run it? Because <laughs> then everyone would practice against it. Yeah. I mean, the most difficult thing against that off, that di going up against this offense right now is if you play one of these teams, you have to dedicate X amount of time to practice for that one team, that one game. And then you don't use it ever again. That's why it's so difficult. It's not if everybody was doing it, you would practice for it all the time. Hence, it wouldn't be unique. Hence, it wouldn't be hard to defend. The biggest part about this is the amount of time and amount of energy you have to dedicate to pra practicing up against this one offense. It's a good equalizer offense for that reason. And what it can do if you're a school like Georgia Tech where you've got high admission standards, you don't have to have NFL star, NFL star, NFL star. When you look at their offensive line, they look like power forwards and tight ends. <laughs> they do not look like big beef. Of course, sort of Tennessee's last year, but they do not look like the typical big, huge, strong, massive SEC line. Uh, you don't. You can recruit a little bit lesser talent, and I think that's one thing. Another reason that teams don't use it. The negative on that is harder to recruit to that kind of offense because you don't see them churning tons of people into the NFL. So I think that makes it difficult. But it, it's a little like uh, Tennessee fans would think of this with the first three years Bruce Pearl was here with his up-tempo offense. That is an equalizer in basketball. There aren't tons of teams that do it, and those teams that do it rarely win the championship. You don't see many NCAA tournament champions who've been that up and down the court kind of a thing. But it does give you an opportunity to lure another team into playing your style. And if you've got enough talent there, you, may can, you might overachieve a little bit. And I think that that's a little bit what you're looking at with this offense in football. It's it gives teams that might not have as much talent an opportunity that they wouldn't normally have. Uh, example, Nick Saban said a couple of years ago, that the teams that give his teams the most fits. Option, Georgia Southern a few years ago ran for 350 yards on Alabama's defense. That wasn't a fluke. Uh, that, that style of offense is difficult to get ready for. Well, I, I think that the scheduling so far this year, we've, we've heard Bush Jones talk about it in the negative light. I think it actually is, is a positive for this team because you've had all summer, you've had all camp to prepare for the option Georgia Tech defense or uh, offense that you're just not used to. So the defense is going to be able to put a lot of time into getting used to that. And then the quick turnaround, you're going to an Indiana State 
And you, you put that team there because you know, hey, if we're playing on a, a Monday and then we're playing Saturday. You gotta have a cupcake. You gotta have a cupcake. And so now you're, you have a little bit more time. You know, it's a short period to say, okay, transition back to pro style stuff, but it's a team you should beat. Here's my disagreement with that scheduling. Never. Schedule a team that does the option. <laughs> Don't put it on your schedule. Don't waste the time going up against that. But, but here's, the thing. here's the thing, though. If if you are going to schedule one, I think David's right. You'd rather play in first oh, game of the first year. First game. Good. First game or, or bowl, bowl game. Or bowl that's game. That's bowl game probably playing. preferable to yeah. the first game. Well, but I say first game. It takes them a couple of uh, games to get that timing yeah, we on talked about game that, speed. We talked about that in today's show. That when they've opened against an FBS opponent, they haven't opened up as well as they do against the, yes, the Patsies. And they're, they're, they're average – is less in those openers than it is for the season. So they're a little, they, it takes them a while to get the, to get the precision of that offense down. Absolutely. Okay, Dan, you want to weigh in on that one at all? I you got it. That one all right, <laughs> then I'll ask you, which player for Tennessee this year will stand out? Who's going to be a standout performer for the balls this year? These are all your questions from Twitter, by the way. Um, I think it's going to be Dormandy. From, from some of the stuff that I've seen, and of course, seen in the past couple of years as well, um, we actually got to do a, a pet adoption day at PetSmart with him as well. Just being able to talk to him to see his poise, see his leadership capabilities. I'm looking for a good year out of him. All right. I think if he has a good year, then you, Juwan Jennings is going to have a great year. I mean, I, I think that's the two plays there. You've got to have a good quarterback play. I think you've got to have a dominant wide receiver. He's going to be that guy. So I think they, if, if Dormady has that great year, Juwan Jennings is going to have a really good year. If Dormady has a good year, I think your team's going to have a good year. I think you can win eight games and, and put, the, put the, the angry masses at ease a little bit. A little bit. I'd, I'd, I'd say Kelly. You know, I, I think, you know, a, a guy that showed a lot of flashes last year, you know, hopefully there's some improvement on the offensive line. They're going to be able to run the ball because that's going to be really important if you're breaking in a young or a new quarterback. You know, if you can have some strength there, you're going to take a lot off his shoulders and allow him to perform. So, but Kelly. Sterling, who's going to be your standout performer for the season? Hey, first of all, those guys got all great guys, but I think the standout guy who puts the naysayers down, Wolf. Wolf, <laughs> Wolf, he's going to stand up his head and make those big catches and make some big plays for the Tennessee Volunteer football team this year. That's amazing. So you're backing. I'm backing the Wolf, okay. the team Wolf. Ooh, wolf, <laughs> wolf, Wolf, All right. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the magic number of rushing yards that Tennessee has to hold Georgia Tech to? Will, we played this on radio the other day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, uh, what, did we, what did we do? You said 250. I said 250 and you said 225. 225. Why? Well, because against the SEC teams they lost, they went over 224. But here's the thing. Or 226. Yeah, we did the over. Well, yeah, they, the over-under. Uh, we did the over in the show as Georgia Tech will run for more than 239. Mm. All right, so uh, what's your magic number for Tennessee to win? And you thought they'd go for 239. Yeah. That's the thing. If, you, if they run for 239, if they pass for 12. That's where I'm at. That's what's <laughs> up. My, my they thought exactly. They throw the ball. So. I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, they, they get their rushing yards, but their rushing yards is the entire offense. My, my, my question is keep the entire offense under 320. When that happens, we win. I think we win big. Is there a magic rushing yards number for you, David? <sighs> you know, it's, it's tough with a team that runs the option. That's, that's what they do um, to, to put a – hard number on it, but I'd probably say less than 250 because if you're doing that, you're thinking they're probably at least getting, what, 14 points out of that. You know, maybe they get another seven somewhere else, so now you're at 21, and that's about where I put them score. And I think the way the question was asked that we handed was, ten we know Tennessee's in real trouble if Georgia Tech rushes for X. And you said 225, and I said 250. Yeah, because once they hit that number, I think your chances of winning yeah. start decreasing rapidly as those number of yards go on. Daniel, you got a number? Uh, I'd put it just at an attempt, so three yards an attempt. If you can keep them under three yards an attempt, you Oof. got a chance. You figure they're going to run 50, 60 plays. Yeah. So I'd put it somewhere around 150, 180. Nice. And they start. usually average five and a half. <laughs> so if you hold them to, to three. It would be a good day. Three's a good day. Yeah, that, that would have been... That would be a real damn good your day for last year's team. That would have been a great year, for, a great yeah. day for last year's team. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, this is one, you know, I said in the, uh, at the end of the show, if Tennessee takes care of business in the red zone, I think that's, that's key for them. Because last year, 75% they, of the time, they got a touchdown in the red zone. That's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yes. Uh, but, but George Tech has this bend, but don't break defense. You no longer have the run pass op uh, option that Dobbs brings in the red zone. So I don't know that you're going to be as, as good in the red zone. But my key, if Tennessee kills it in the red zone, that's their key, in my opinion. Georgia Tech's key, if they hit a bomb on you, you're counting on stopping their run. 
if they somehow get lucky with a deep ball or two and they put points up in the passing game, then I think you're in real trouble. They, you know, you're, you're counting on – if they put points on us, it's going to be that run game. If they come out there and hit some big bomb that you're not expecting, I, I think that could be too much to overcome because I don't think you're going to stop the run. And if you start falling down and letting guys get past you into the end zone through the passing game, then I think you're in real trouble. That's, that's an incredible point right there, John P. But I think what's happening with the passing game in our defensive backfield, we've got seven guys that can play literally ready to play. I mean, when Coach Martinez left the Coach Charlton Walton and he's doing his thing, our backs, defensive backs right now, are probably as strong as they've been in the past 10 years. we got seven guys that are ready to play and game ready. Yeah. Do you guys expect another question from Twitter? Do you guys expect to see more Elliott and Evan Berry on defense this year? Yes. I think you'll see more Elliott on defense. There's been talk about Evan getting a couple of snaps on offense. Um, but I, I would say yes, probably. Let's right. see. Yeah. Why not? You're starting off with guys yeah, getting I mean, injured all yeah. over the place. You might as well start <laughs> figuring out somebody else to put out there. I mean, you got to get some speed eventually. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If we can go back to this, this is your linebacker situation. If you go by there too deep, this is what they're looking like for tomorrow. Okay, Elliot Berry would be the backup to Cortez McDowell on paper. Now, when you get into the game, they may shift these guys around, but Elliot Berry would be there. Um, but you're looking, I mean, you can't suffer many more injuries, folks, or you're down to the Berries and nobody else. Well, and you got to think too. You know, defense. I mean, it's it, it's exhausting when they're running all over the field. Those three starters aren't going to be out there all the time. Right. I mean, you're going to have guys that need a break. You're, you, I think you'll definitely see Elliott out there. And, and that's something Shoop and, and Butch Jones have both talked about. They are prepared to have a, a lot. They want to play a lot of players. They especially want to play a lot of defensive linemen mm -hmm. in this game, um, which gets us to a shy Tuttle question. But Jimmy answered it in the show. Would he play him? He said he wouldn't because the cut blocking at Georgia Tech is dangerous. You got a guy with a history of leg injuries. Two years in a row, his season was cut, shut, cut short. Um, but when you look at rotating the defensive line, do you think that means they will rotate him in there? I think if he's healthy and he's ready to go, I mean, you got to trust your guy. If the trainers tell you he's ready, if he's done his rehab and everything else, uh, if he's a ball player, then that's what you've worked on all week. So I think you put him in. And he's, he's worked his butt off trying to get ready, John P. Oh, yeah. yeah nobody worked, expected him to he be. He worked yeah. his butt off. So the doctor says he's ready to go. He's shown the, the heart it takes to be a volunteer to get back on that field. I think it's I'm, easy. You know, I'm I've cautious. Never, I've never been a coach. No. So I think from a player's perspective, if you're ready to go, who cares what you're playing? You want to play. And so exactly. you think, sure, if he's ready to go, put him in there. I mean, there may be something to it, thinking about from the coach's perspective of, I need this guy for the long haul. Maybe he doesn't get as many snaps. Maybe he doesn't play. I, I, I'm going right, to be honest. I'm going to go out there a couple, couple, couple series, and I don't have to play him. I don't have to play him. If the uh, game starts going to our way where we're kind of getting up stuff, he's not coming in. I mean, I just yeah. – I, I basically say if I feel like I have to for us to have a chance to win, am I going to play him? Yes. If I'm the coach, I'm holding back until that point. I agree with that. My, if, if I, in a perfect world, if I were Butch Jones, I would already sit, sit him down and tell him, you're coming back Florida week. We're going to get you healthier these next two weeks, but be ready. If, if we're desperate, we will break glass in case of emergency and put yeah. you in there. If you, knew, if you knew you had the wins in the back, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Why not? Ooh. Okay. Austin Smith, out for how long? Nobody knows yet. It's a sprained knee. The good news, it's believed to be a sprained knee. Uh, Go Balls 24-7, I think, had the story first, and then VolQuest uh, wrote that it was a uh, sprain, they believe. Sprain's better than a tear. Uh, Kirkland, of course, is out for the year, it looks like. Um, huge loss. But Smith, if it's a sprained knee, it just depends on how quickly he personally can recover from that. I mean, some guys can be back in two weeks. Some guys it takes six weeks. Uh, usually sprained knees like an MCL, something like that. So that, I had that my senior year. It took me about four weeks. But unfortunately, after that four weeks, even if you're able to get out on the field, you're still not really 100%. Yeah. I mean, you're still having a hard time planting and reacting uh, when you have to shift. You can go forward and backwards and forward fairly well, but the shifts are a little painful. But uh, maybe four weeks, three to four weeks, depending on how bad a sprain it is, you can get back out there with a knee brace on. But then, like I said, usually it takes you a little bit more time before you're back to where you feel like right. where you were playing before you had that. Happen. Any of those knee injuries, you can usually watch ACLs especially, which is a whole different dynamic than what we're talking about here with mm -hmm. a sprain. But any of those knee injuries, you can typically say, guy is better the year after your returns yeah. then, I mean, so 
uh, when you put him back, well, we saw it, it wasn't a sprained knee, but Cam Sutton last year worked, cool. worked like hell to get out there and he got out there. He wasn't the same Cam Sutton on the field. No. He was out there, but he wasn't the same right. guy you saw early in the year before the injury. All right, uh, speaking of health concerns, got this one on Twitter. Someone watched the Alabama Florida State game last night, which was at Mercedes Benz Stadium, uh, and those black rubber pellets were flying everywhere every time you tackle somebody. Somebody said, that can't be healthy. Do you have concerns for the player's health with those things? And before anybody rolls their eyes, there have been studies that have linked those rubber pellets to cancer. Yeah. I think right. it's a I think it's <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I mean, but, so, so, so there's enough stuff going on <laughs> yeah, now. I mean, right? so, like, you know, you. One, one of the things, I, actually, I noticed that as well. I think that's a product of just being a new field. That stuff hasn't settled as much. But yeah. it seemed like a lot of sand out there, too. So maybe they're changing the mix up. But I have seen the, I think a lot of, like, uh, women's soccer players have, have experienced that because they're always, I guess, out on those types of fields. I don't know. Yeah, I don't but think I, it's, I've seen the reports. Yeah, I, I don't think it's anything for tennis. If you, you play one game on it, I don't think it's a concern. But I wouldn't want to play my entire career on it if they're coming out with well, studies that say, hey, it killed 58 rats yesterday. I mean, that's, <laughs> right. What I think happened is because if, if you guys noticed yesterday's game, Alabama Florida State game, it was all in high def. So you had, uh, you know, a higher volume if you changed the channel. I know I did. You had, you had a, a more vivid picture if you changed the uh. channel. I know I did. So I think because of the, the high-def telecast, you saw more of what's happening in the game. That's not much different than what happens on a weekly basis. You can see it more, yes. I agree, though. I mean, I've been on those fields, you know, practice fields, whatever. But it takes a while for that stuff. Those things shoot out a lot more than the yeah. first couple of games on those kinds of fields. Before they settle in, so they get everywhere. Though. Man, they get everywhere. All right, give me your. Uh, we're, Take uh, home with you. <laughs> we'll close out here. I, I gave you my keys. I think if Tennessee does well in the red zone, they'll win this game. I think if Georgia Tech somehow does anything in the passing game, uh, that's almost too much. With this defense, where they are, what they looked like last year, and that's all I've got to go on. That or hope. Uh, and I'm Not too cautious. Hope you. I'm too cautious to ever go with hope. <laughs> so, I, I, to me, if Georgia Tech has any success in the passing game at all, I think you're beat. Uh, keys. You can give me a Tennessee key. You can give me a Georgia Tech key. Whatever you want to do, you can give me both. What are your keys to this game? Key to this game, game max number three. Play four, make the breaks. One comes our way, score. Be some breaks happening in this game. We have to score it every one we get. I, I, I'm sticking with the rushing. I mean, both sides. So the offense has got to, you know, work your, your new quarterback into it. T you know, control that game clock. I think that's a big thing. Because if you allow Georgia Tech to just run all over you, they're going to eat up a lot of clock. Your defense is going to get exhausted, and the offense isn't going to be out there being able to score. Well, Overstreet. Tennessee's got one known quantity key strength coming back that it can really separate itself in a game against a close team. That's special teams. they got a guy back there that can make things happen. It's one of the best in the country doing it. He shows up, he comes out, he changes momentum, makes the play. That's the difference in the ball game. And, wow. and well, and there's another guy on special wow. teams too. You've got an all you've got an all-American caliber guy as punter. Right. Wow. So if, if field position does begin to play a bigger and bigger role, you may have an edge there as well. But certainly the Evan Berry is a kick returner. That could change the game right on it, turn the game right on its seal. And I was Daniel actually Hood. special teams was probably my number two when I started looking at this game. Georgia Tech's just, you know, middle of the road to even back end of it on a lot of their special teams. But I think the thing that will help Tennessee win the most is going to be their unknowns. You know, Georgia Tech's coming into a game with Bob Shoup with a staff that he, you know, he's really put together now. So how's that defense going to change? How are they going to look this year when they went to that second level football from first level? You got Dormandy. You know, he's a completely different style quarterback than Dobbs. How's this new offense coordinator going to look with him? You know, how has all your assistants changed up, your defensive line, your, uh, um, uh, your cornerbacks and, and those guys? Because from someone that had five different, you know, defensive line coaches, offensive line coaches, whatever, every single thing would change. You put value on different things. So what are those things going to look like? And then you got to be able to manage that field position with your special teams. All right. Daniel Hood, Will Overstreet, David Liggins, Sterling Hinton, appreciate you guys being with us. I look forward to seeing you off and on throughout the rest of this football season. And, Will, I practically get – attached to you at the hip during football season. Right. We'll do radio, we'll do the Fox 43 show, we'll do this show. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in here, and uh, we will see you, as I just said, we'll talk to you Friday on WNML. We'll see you Saturday morning on Fox 43 at 1030 for our preview show, and then we'll see you for our Indiana State breakdown show, the review show, next Sunday on WATE with the Sports Source. Thank you very much. See you next week.